Hello, and welcome to the State Bar of Arizona's first ever virtual convention. My name is Tim Igo, and I'm the editor of Arizona Attorney Magazine. We just heard from our phenomenal keynote speaker, Ken uh, Wadike Jr., and I must take a moment first to acknowledge a few phenomenal sponsors. Our diamond patrons are law firms Tiffany and Bosco, Lerner and Rowe Injury Attorneys, Berg Simpson, Mercaldo Law Firm, Perkins Coie, and Jennings Strauss. And the State Bar's top tier corporate sponsors are the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University, the University of Arizona James E. Rogers College of Law, Law Pay, JS Held, and Wealth Council. Remember, these sponsors are hanging tough with us and taking a chance on this virtual gathering experience. Be sure to send them some love and your business. And that reminds me how perfectly chosen our keynote speaker is. 2020, of course, has changed everything, including how we interact as we gain knowledge to help our lives and advance our law practices. Given the remarkable events we've all lived through this year, the selection of our keynote speaker could not have been more ideal. As our nation struggles with racial inequities, unrest over policing strategies, a pandemic, and the resulting social isolation that is required of all of us, hearing from Ken feels like a breath of fresh air. As you've already heard from him, he is a peace activist. That commitment has led him to stand between angry factions on America's streets, but it also has led him to explore the ways we all can advance understanding by fostering inclusiveness in our workplaces and communities. So it's my pleasure to welcome Ken today for a short but deep dive into his goals, strategies, and ideals. Ken, welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, it's awesome to connect with you guys again after the uh, the keynote. So um, I'm excited to be doing this extended portion with you today. It's our privilege. It's so good to meet you. So uh, Ken, that was an amazing and rejuvenating keynote. Thank you so much again. And so I'm sitting here and I was watching it, taking it all in, uh, when suddenly you showed the footage of you, um, well, here it is, is sharing hugs for the first time yes. at the Boston Marathon in 2014. Uh, and I've got to admit, I was startled to realize <clears throat> as I sat there watching it all by my lonesome uh, that I had the biggest smile on my face <laughs> and I had a lump in my throat. Um, yeah. So thank you for that. I didn't expect it. Have you heard from others that your efforts, which are really on the surface, very simple human interactions, have you heard from others that they pack an emotional punch? Yes, ab absolutely. Um, it was really interesting, just the response that even came from that video and the media outlets that had reached out to me because of that emotional punch that it packed. I, I think, like you shared, you you laugh, you smile, but you also get emotional feeling like, where is that love today? And, and like right now, especially during this pandemic, where we're really wanting to reach out and connect with people and and we can't and so watching that which was recorded all the way back in 2014 it's this reminder of of what we're missing what's lacking in our life right now and i think that gives it even more power today when people watch it than even in 2014 when it had enough of an impact that led to the creation of the free hugs project yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. You know, the last six months, you know, maybe I wouldn't have teared up if it hadn't been six months ago. So <laughs> you might have. I don't know. <laughs> That's you true. Have. You never know. So it occurred to me, uh, Ken, that all of your interactions, all of your projects, many parts, require you personally to take a leap of faith, don't they? I mean, uh, the runners might not have hugged you back, and then yeah. there's this guy standing there, feeling not great. Yeah. So. Uh, Tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, that could have been an embarrassing interaction because, you know, I had the camera set up. Um, and you can imagine when I first presented this idea to my wife and I said, I'm going to fly out to Boston and do this. So after already getting laughed at by the kids that I was mentoring at the homeless shelter, it said, no one's going to hug you in Boston. And then 
I brought it up to my wife and she's like, you're going to do what? And so like, I had to prove that point to everyone that I think we as a nation that, that we're better than this, that if someone extends an open invitation for a hug, right. And I don't look like some creepy weirdo or something standing out on the side that maybe <laughs> people would take me up on, on this offer. And, and to my surprise, so that ended up being the largest Boston Marathon of all time. Over 50,000 people registered to run in that race because it was like America's response to say, we will not be intimidated by this terrorist attack that happened in 2013. So people came out as powerful as possible. Um, hence the, the hashtag Boston Strong that came out during that time. And, and so I felt the need to be there despite what my wife and, and some of the kids at the shelter were saying. And, and I'm so glad that I did because yes, it is really embarrassing when you're standing there hoping, is anyone gonna take me up on this offer for a hug? And thousands of people did, so it was amazing. Yeah, and, and it's not just the, the hugs, it's pretty much all parts of your project. When you stand in front between angry people, I, I, do you ever, uh, I, I mean, every one of those requires a leap of faith on your part, yes. and therefore you're hoping the people around you take the leap of faith as well. Do you ever uh, stand there and think, that's it? This was stupid. My wife was right. This is never going to work. <laughs> yes. Um, there have been times where um, in, in the middle of an intense conflict, I can remember one time for sure. Um, if you remember the, um, the Dakota Access Pipeline protests that were going on some years ago uh, sure. with the Native Americans out in, um, in Standing Rock, and they were going up against the private security companies and the law enforcement agencies there. Um, that was one of those few places where I felt completely out of my league. I was like, what am I doing here? Um, <clears throat> this isn't really the place to uh, to try and bring like these opposing sides together. Those private security companies there like wanted to have no dialogue, no conversation at all. They were literally sicking dogs on people. And, and then the Native Americans... You had the elders who were very peaceful, but then you had uh, the young, uh, I think they referred to them as the young bulls of the tribe, like the kids between like 18 to 21, who they didn't want to talk either. And so here I am in the middle, like trying to organize, how do you bring these two sides together, even if it's not this hug or kumbaya moment, but at least can we just see each other as human beings? And and that was one of those times where I, I felt like I was powerless. And so after about a couple of days there, I ended up leaving. So, so yes, there are times where uh, even this work, no matter how much good you're trying to do, um, sometimes it can be ineffective, uh, but you still have to rise up for another day and, and find uh, other places where you can be effective and, and where you're needed. Tell me more about the feeling when it does work, though. I mean, I, I, it's got to be the best feeling in the world. What is it like when you realize I'm getting through? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in that video clip that I shared during the keynote uh, where I hugged the officer, um, Chris Frunzi, he um, that that moment, it was such a healing moment, even though of course, I had to face the protesters who gave me a lot of flack about it. Um, but I feel like that flack is actually what led to that interaction being so amazing. Because rather than me cowering down or or running off, if if this message is love and this message is unity and um, taking notes from Dr. King on um, peaceful resolutions and, and methods of nonviolence, then I have to act that out. I, I have to walk that and demonstrate that. And so that was an opportunity that was um, so beautifully captured by the media outlets that were there that were like, what is about to happen <laughs> right now? You know, and then including um, my buddy who had the camera as well, because for a moment we thought that we were going to get attacked by this mob of, of protesters. And so to actually um, shift that that moment and that interaction. And now still till today, myself and officer Chris Frunzi, uh, we are r really good friends. We talk on a regular basis. As a matter of fact, we spoke today. Um, 
a really unfortunate situation that he's going through right now. Two of his young sons were diagnosed with cancer, uh, his eight-year-old son and his two-year-old son. Uh, so it's a really, really tragic and heartbreaking situation he's been enduring for the past year. But but that shows the beauty of connecting these types of friendships. The fact that I I know that and I care about his situation and um, I've launched a GoFundMe and I'm planning on flying out there to spend some time with them at St. Jude's in Tennessee. This was literally a cop that I met on the front lines of a riot in riot gear. And now today he is the, um, the godfather of my two-year-old twins and I'm the godfather of his son, um, Bennett, who is in the hospital right now. Jackson is the older brother. Um, but that's where it worked, right? Like that connection became very real. And some of those protesters I still speak with till today, as well as that officer. And so we we know the power of positive human interaction uh, can break down some serious walls and, and barriers. And that was one of those moments out of the many interactions that I've had over the years. Uh, but that's one that is very dear to me. Yeah, I can imagine. So I'd like to talk more about the protests um, in a moment, but I'd like to take a step back and I'm fascinated by the evolution of your work um, because uh, like other leaders throughout history, and I think of Martin Luther King and you're, you know, I, I you know, you, you do similar work. Um, you started an important initiative at the grassroots. Mm -hmm. uh, it grew to be national. You do national TV interviews, just like other national leaders ha have. Yeah. Uh, but then you decided to do something different. Uh, you felt like you had to return to the grassroots and, and um, while still keeping the national profile. So I'm wondering why you did that. And does that limit your impact or does it widen it somehow? Oh, that's that's a great question. Um, I so I guess the best way I could I could look at that is, yes, it does limit your impact, but it strengthens your impact and the relationships in the places that you're going. So your your reach may not be as broad, but the impact that you are able to have um, in in a <clears throat> close proximity with the people that you're working with is far more powerful. And and that's why grassroots is so important to me because when you're building relationships, it it can't be. Um, very superficial or, or on the surface. You have to make sure that you are like really dialed in and connected with the people that you're, you're building these relationships with. And, and so, yeah, I mean, it would have been great to remain on like a national level and even sometimes traveling outside of the country. Like I did the Good Morning Britain show and I've spent some time in London where they said, well, Ken, we know that the Brits are not very huggy people. We would <laughs> love to see what type of an impact you would have out here. And and it was great. I had a phenomenal experience when I was in London. And um, But there's times where you realize how many social issues exist right here in your own home country um, that require that attention. And so I like to hone in and spend more focus uh, or attention here. Yeah, I can see that. So, um, you know, everybody, you know, myself included, tries to analyze your success. And one thing I go back to is the fact that you're an accomplished runner. You're a, you. yeah. a sprinter, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, what I know about athletes is that they're trained to put into hard work. They think strategically. They avoid distractions. They keep their eyes on the prize. Yeah. Um, but I wonder whether that can make you impatient for those of us who have none of those skills, honestly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the rest of us who are trying to catch up to where you're at. And, and of course, at this point, I don't mean as an athlete. I mean, in terms of your thinking about peace. So uh, do you have to get yourself to be patient with people? Um, yes and no. So I, I, I love the uh, connection to um, sports, athletics, and, and especially running. But I think as a uh, so as a miler, I'm in between the sprints and the distance runs, right? So I'm like right in the middle. So there are times that I know that uh, some of the things that we do in life can can be like a sprint, but most of the things that we do, we're in it for the long haul. And so we're taking our time and, and going through those steps. And that's the same way that I view peace. That's the same way that I view unity and, and these interactions. It is definitely not a sprint. 
Sometimes it's those one-on-one -on -one interactions that we get to have with people that can change the tides. Uh, people often ask me, especially when I'm giving lectures at colleges, they say, hey, Ken, do you think that racism will ever die? And I'm like, it's it's going to take some time and some of the old racists will have to die off. And let's hope that they don't teach their children or indoctr indoctrinate their children to be that way. And then, yes, we'll start to see change. But we may not see um, the, the change that we want during our lifetime, but that shouldn't stop us from taking the necessary steps to, to have those interactions. And, and it's not always in extreme cases. It's not always on the front lines of a riot or a protest. It's even for you all in your day-to-day -day work and your day-to-day -day interactions that you have with people um, to say, what am I doing to create the America that I would like my children to be brought up in? And, and sometimes it takes us taking that step back and saying, you know, this interaction that I want to have with this person or this group, what does this do towards moving society forward? And I often think about those things when I go into interactions with people, especially if my children are around or um, will have questions about the things that I do or the places that I go. I always want to make sure that I'm setting an example for that younger generation because this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. You know, I can I, I appreciate that. I'm fascinated by your process. And I, I wonder whether the work that you have to do, I mean, to put it baldly on yourself yeah. as you work through this, would you ever have to tell yourself, Ken, be patient, don't be judgmental. It's a process. People will get there. Yeah. I, I mean, people must frustrate you. <laughs> <laughs> totally. You can imagine as a, uh, as a black man in America, sometimes my work requires me to go into, like I've been to a KKK rally, right? So you can imagine the mental preparedness that I have to go through to tell myself, okay, certain things are going to be said to you. Don't let it get under your skin. You're there for a reason. Or certain places that, that I go and the conversations that I have with people, um, I, I know that it will require me to keep a leveled head. And, and, and to just be cool because the overall goal of what I'm trying to accomplish is more important than, as you said, people frustrating me, right? Like people will frustrate all of us and, and it's how we handle it. It's how we respond to it. And again, not just for me on the front lines, but I can imagine in, in your guys' work, right? Like in, in the legal and professional field, I bet it's oh, not. Oh, people are the worst. <laughs> <laughs> I bet, right? Like you guys have to deal with like people at their worst even. Yeah. And like, I can only imagine what, what that's like. Um, I shared, I think in, in uh, a portion of the keynote, how I, I planned on going to law school, right? And like, as I had some of those mock trials in college. And I was like, I don't know that I could do this for the rest of my life. Like people will frustrate me. So I know that you guys have to endure a lot of things. And so again, my work may seem extreme being out on, on the front lines, but you all have to deal with that day in and day out just with, with the work that you do um, in your profession. Yeah. Well, that's true. You know, it's funny. I hadn't thought of it until you said it, uh, Ken, but um, you know, you, uh, like lawyers very often, are meeting people at the most stressful, maybe worst moment of their lives. Yes, yes. And so that isn't necessarily who they really are, but that's where you are at that moment. So Yeah, no, totally. I, I mean, I, I know that like the last interaction that I had with, with a lawyer, it was um, earlier this year, right when the pandemic started, um, some teens had stolen a car and they smashed into my car in an intersection and uh, their family had hired a lawyer. And I, I remember in dealing with him throughout that whole situation, there were times where we would get into like these really tense debates on the phone. And then after we started to get to a peaceful resolution, I had told him, I, I said, you know what, John, um, you're, you're a really nice guy, man. And I'm glad about the way that all of this was handled. And he was like, we're not supposed to be on the same team, Ken. Like I, I was not expecting a compliment from you. And, and I was like, you know, I know we got off on, on the wrong foot. I was really frustrated about 
having my car smashed by these kids in an intersection and they take off and run off on foot. And, and your job obviously is to reduce their punishment. Right. And I said, but I get that you're just doing a job and, and these are kids. And he was so blown away at my like taking a step back and just looking at the big picture and realizing these were people like in their worst moment, right? Like their families didn't want to see their kids face harsh punishments at the beginning of a pandemic or even going to juvenile hall. And I didn't want that for these young people either. I wanted them to understand the mistake that they made and, and we can move on. And so I, I know exactly what that feels like when you're dealing with people in really tense situations, sometimes at their worst, including myself. I felt like I wasn't my best self in my initial conversations <laughs> with that lawyer, but uh, but it all panned out well. And, and I think that's important for us to do that is to always recognize it. Like you said, this isn't how the people that we're interacting with, that's not how they are every day. And, and so we shouldn't judge people based on that. Uh, we should always recognize the moment that they're in. Yeah, I, I love that. So so I learned something here today. You gandhi a lawyer. I mean, <laughs> yeah. man, that's very, that's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> so Ken, I, I, I do want to talk a little bit more about the uprisings that you've been uh, standing in the middle of and observing the entire range of your life and your project. Uh, it's clear you're committed to peace and anti-racism. Absolutely. Uh, here's an example. We can see you here uh, standing between angry people at an uprising. Yes. But I, I do have to ask, at a time when a U.S. president looks at protesters and racists and says there are good people on both sides, mm. I have to ask, do you worry that some listeners think that you're saying the same thing as the president did? Oh, that's that is a great question. Um, so on the day that he said that, I was actually in that alley in Charlottesville when James Fields ran over 19 people. And I was there the night before of the Tiki Torch March when they came marching through with their flags and things, chanting Jews will not replace us. And, and I remember the fear that not only I had, but some of the members of the community there, but also law enforcement. I remember turning to some of the officers as these like guys were hitting um, college students with their tiki torches that night outside of the university. And I remember asking some of the officers that were standing nearby on the hill, I said, aren't you guys going to rush in and do anything about it? And they said, Ken, this is an open carry state. And we're still trying to assess the situation because we know a number of people there are armed and we can't just go rushing in. And, and to me, it, it sounded like, one, of course, they were trying to assess the situation, but they're human beings. They were j just as afraid as all of the rest of us. And then the next day, it culminated to 19 people being run over right in front of me in this alley. And, and so my concern with that, the way that was presented, good people on, on both sides, I know that the protesters and the members of the community that were there that day, they were, were fighting for equality. They were concerned that some of these statues that were left up there, all they were saying was a, a statue of like Robert E. Lee should be moved to a museum and not in the middle of like this square where um, he's being honored and, and as like this, like, memorial when we know that he was a confederate general and so that was the debate that was taking place that debate should have remained a conversation and not led to 19 innocent people being run over in an alley and heather Heyer losing her life in that alley right in front of me and so that sort of rhetoric of well there's good people on on both sides I, I know that even with my work, um, like you said, some people may misconstrue that and say, well, Ken, if you're trying to bring both sides together, aren't you kind of saying the same thing? The difference in, in how I see it is that I believe that we all inherently have good in us, but that doesn't mean that everyone shows up with good intentions or, or proper actions when they show up at these things. There were guys there who were armed and, and prepared to cause serious harm 
if confronted, sometimes if confronted by like simple things. I could tell you when I was there, some of the things that I saw, uh, some of the protesters on the community side, they would put paint in water balloons and they would throw them at some of those groups on the other side. That doesn't warrant gunshots being fired into the crowd. It's a water balloon, right? Sometimes you, you match like the same levels of intensity or you let the police do their job. But when we're seeing gunshots go off or, or people using spray torches like hairspray and putting a lighter in front of it and blowing flames at people, it was just such a chaotic scene that I witnessed there that that couple of days that I was in Charlottesville. And, and so I've, I caution people against saying those sort of things that, well, there's good people and there's bad people on both sides. Yes, we are all inherently good but we don't all have good actions or intentions when we show up to things like that. Some people are showing up saying, we want peace, we want unity, we want human rights, uh, we want dignity, we just wanna have a, a fair shot at life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But there are other groups that are not saying those same things. And, and we have to be cautious of that. There sometimes are groups that are showing up that seek to oppress other groups, or, or proclaim um, their, um, I don't even know how, how you would put it, uh, just feeling like they are better than other groups that are there and that these symbols of how what many people would view as hate, they would say, well, I mean, if you like those symbols or those statues so much, there should be a museum where you can go to to see those. And, and that was the general consensus of a lot of the protesters. Sadly, it led to a life lost and 19 people uh, being hit by a, a vehicle. All right, I, I, that makes a lot of sense. But let me let me poke on this just a little bit more because I sure. I think you were discussing uh, different groups of protesters um, uh, and their different motivations Absolutely. and and behaviors. Um, we haven't really talked about the I guess the third side, which is the police side. Yes. There. And so let me frame it uh, this way. You have uh, talked about, you've looked at disputes uh, through this lens that none of us is a robot, which I love. None of us is a robot. Each of us is human. And each of us wants to go home safe at the end of the night. Yes. That's absolutely true. But I wonder if um, anyone's ever said that that turns a blind eye to the wide gap in the, the power to do bad things that each side has. I mean, so uh, do you risk communicating that um, deep institutional problems like racism in institutions or racism in policing is no better or worse than somebody throwing a brick? Ooh, um, that's good. That's that's a, a good question. I, I think that it's it's tough, you know, when you think about how some of the the officers there, especially who are are there to do a job, I I feel like the front lines is not necessarily the place to have these conversations for change, because when we spoke about a moment ago, people at their worst, like if that's what you all are dealing with in in the legal profession, imagine at ten or eleven p.m. at night when there's tear gas in the air, pepper spray, police and body armor, no change is going to happen there through that, that conversation. And, and so my goal of, of what I try to get people to realize is, yes, the change that we are all um, uh, hoping for is possible. However, on the front lines is, is not the time to try and seek any change in, in those moments. Now, people marching to demonstrate, to, to show that we are all in unity here, uh, marching through the streets to show that we collectively disagree with the way things have been handled. I completely get that. But now when they meet and they clash, or it leads to violence or property damage, I think that changes everything, right? So, so there is that fine line of how do you raise awareness while still being effective in, in showing that we as a group have concerns about the way that 
things have been, whether it's racism or uh, a, a direct incident that people can reference. Well, that's that's awesome. Thank you so much. You know, here are a couple other images of you um, uh, speaking to and standing among uh, people who are angry on two sides or, yes. or three sides. Um, and I want to ask you about something you said before, which you said, I came from a community that didn't get along with the police. Yep. Uh, and today I feel constantly conflicted as I stand in the middle. Um, and I can see that that comes across here. Um, you are on high alert. You, I can tell in every single picture you're thinking, you're seeing, uh, you have eyes in the back of your head to see what's going on and trying to figure out the be best best next step. Yes. And I, I, I know that images of you hugging police officers, I mean, you've talked about this, um, may cause some deep discomfort among some protesters, especially those advocating for police reform. Yes. Yes. And I imagine that pictures of you hugging protesters make some police, you know, <laughs> yes. Just Everyone uncomfortable to you on their you, side. Yeah. So what do you say to those who are troubled on both sides who feel discomfort when they see you doing that? Yeah. So so I guess a really interesting way to to look at that is um, when I think about the other side of, of that coin. So I host a podcast called the Black and Blue podcast that I just started with Sheriff Chris Swanson of the Flint Genesee Police Department. And he is like this large, like muscular white guy, like who you wouldn't assume that he would go and march with like these Black Lives Matter protesters as the sheriff of the police department, right? And so there was a protest that was taking place in response to the George Floyd incident. And um, he was out there and he said to the protesters, what do you want me to do? And they started chanting, march with us. And he told all of his officers, you know what, stand down, put down your um, your armor or your shields and let's march with the protesters. And they walked for miles. And he shared with me just recently that as he was walking through the streets with these uh, protesters, that uh, there were people on the opposite side of uh, of that conversation who were standing, lining the streets, and they're like, hey, sheriff, that's why you're not going to get elected, because out there, the sheriff is in elected position. And they said, that's why you're not going to get elected, because you're out here as the sheriff marching with the Black Lives Matter protesters. And, and he recently shared with me, he's like, what do people want us to do? On one hand, you want unity, but then you want us to be divided. And, and he's like, we're stuck in this like really difficult place. And I was like, I hear you, Sheriff. <laughs> Trust me, I hear you. I'm in the exact same place. Everyone wants to kind of put you in a box. They want you to have the same label that they have. Black Lives Matter may want me to join Black Lives Matter or uh, the law enforcement agencies that I go and speak to and host trainings on de-escalation methods. And they follow me now on social media. And many of them, sometimes if I post certain things, they're like, hey, I thought you were on our side. And I'm like, wait, I'm not on anyone's side. I'm on the free hug side. I'm on the side of unity. I'm on the side of love. I'm on the side of us moving forward as a as a society. And, and yes, you're totally correct that it like no matter which way you go, you're probably going to offend someone or rub someone the wrong way, but you have to be true to yourself. And I shared that same thing with the sheriff that th these counter protesters may want you to be a certain way, but you have to be true to who you are. And one thing I know about Sheriff Chris Swanson is his heart is probably bigger than his like massive muscular frame. And I'm like, dude, to be yourself and, and people will just appreciate you for that. And, and that's one of the things that really comes across in my interactions with him is that people see two men, two fathers, two husbands that just really care about the people that we interact with. And for him being all the way out there on the East Coast in, in Detroit, and for me living here in California on the West Coast, like you all, the things that we face as a society are very different. You know, even the things that you all experience in Arizona, it's different than what we experience here in, in California, especially for me, I, I live in San Diego, but we have to be true to ourselves and we can't become what society says that we should be, that he as this 
large white officer that he's supposed to think a certain way or behave a certain way, or me as a black man growing up in South Central Los Angeles and in some really underserved like neighborhoods and, and communities, people expect me to behave a certain way. And, and I, I refuse to uh, fit into a label or a box. I just have to be true to myself as Ken. And yes, I get a lot of flack for that. I get a lot of hate on my social media platforms. I get a lot of love too. The love far outweighs the hate. But isn't it strange how the hate stings worse than the love, right? Like you can get a thousand like supportive comments and that one comment that says, you're a disgrace to our people. And I'm like, what? what? Like that one hurts me far more than the thousand supportive comments that I received. Yeah. I'm like, why would you? I, I can imagine. Right? Like, why would they say that? So it's, yeah. and, and the sheriff is the same way. It, it really affects him when people say things like that. You know, you just mentioned social media and uh, you've spoken very thoughtfully in the past about how social media, you know, puts us in echo chambers, puts us in bubbles where we only are fed what we already believe. When you're standing on the street between angry people, how do you see that algorithm playing out right before you? Oh, yes. Oh, it is like clear as day, right? Because sometimes you have protesters that just show up to kind of spectate and, and look around. And 30, 40 minutes into it, they're chanting the same things. They're aggressive. They're getting riled up, right? Because it's, it's almost like you get caught up in the moment or some would say the fanfare. Of, of when you're out there on the front lines of, of these protests. And I'm constantly cautioning people, hey, like they, they don't feed into that. And uh, there's a video, I wish I could I could share it. And maybe if um, there's a way that I can post a link in uh, later on for, for you all to be able to see this interaction. So I was at a, um, a rally in Portland where it was um, a group of, Trump supporters versus Antifa. And I show up there like trying to bridge the gap between these two groups. And it started out really, really bad. And the conversations that I was having with people to try and de-escalate the tension, eventually it led to this really great conversation that I had with this older gentleman where he was being very, very disrespectful to this one young lady that was on the Antifa side. And when I had a conversation with him and reminded him that that's a young lady and that's just not how we should speak to people regardless of where they stand politically. And when he eventually recognized that when he was called out, not only did he apologize to me, but he asked if I could introduce him to that young lady who I didn't even know. And he went and, and, and extended an apology to her. But then he had also shared with me, he said, you know what, Ken, I'll be honest, I got caught up in the moment. I was feeling all of the energy just from everyone yelling and, and shouting. And I see this young woman just trying to talk over everyone. And she was being disrespectful. And I felt the need to put her back in her place. And I'm like, why did you feel the need to do that? You know, like that, this is not. And so it, it's really important that we sometimes take that step back and, and can speak to each other with respect. And, and then he wouldn't have to go back and apologize for these really rude and offensive and demeaning things that he said to this young woman. And, and I'm so glad that he was able to apologize. And um, all of that was captured on video from that interaction. So hopefully I could find the link and, and share it with the group. But it was a really amazing interaction because when the video opens, it's like, whoa, this is intense. But in the end, not only does he apologize, but he says, is, is it okay if I give you a hug to this girl that he was like shouting at and treating with such disrespect? And so I know that sometimes when we could just remind people to, hey, let's take a step back. That is a human being, regardless of what they think politically, that's still a human being. And we have to be careful with how we treat one another and speak to one another. Wow, that is, that's remarkable. So given that we're all the target of the algorithm, Yes. Uh, how do you how do you check in on your own biases and and make adjustments and and how can we? Yeah, it's it's difficult. <laughs> I can tell you that because um, when when we know, like you said, it's not just the algorithms that are that are playing with our minds online, but we we choose to have these real life 
interactions that are very similar to the algorithms where when we go to work or we go to places that we enjoy, we say, oh, that person is part of that side, right? And so we distance ourselves from them rather than saying, I can still befriend this person, but when it becomes that conversation that I know that I am not capable of, of handling or, or discussing in a, uh, in a respectful way, that I would rather stop that conversation as soon as it starts. And I often do that all the time. As a matter of fact, so my sister-in-law um, is on a different political side than my wife and I are. And so she came over to our house during the debates and she was being like really, really mean to my wife during the debates. And my wife, like she had come over to me and she's like, I can't believe my sister would talk to me like this in our house. And I was like, Sabrina, it's your house. Why do you have to feed into it? Don't say another word to her. Don't respond. And I was noticing how her sister kept pressing these buttons and like wanting to get a response or a rise out of her and us. And we just like tuned it out, you know? And as she was like championing for her, like person that she wanted to win in the debates, we were like, let her have that moment. But it didn't end with like this storm out of the house moment or for our kids to have to see this shouting match that would take place. And, and so we, we have to interact with these people because they are our family members. And, it, and it's funny because we're in the holiday season now. And even by the time that like everyone gets to really digest this message, like we're thinking about sitting at the table with family members around the holidays that like th these discussions will come up, right? So we, we have to know that when those things come up, we can choose to ignore it. We can choose to engage in a peaceful manner or when it starts, we could say, hey, it's the holidays. <laughs> Let's keep that discussion out of here. And, and hopefully people will choose to respect that. That's actually the better way to go about it. If we know that we are not capable of handling that discussion in a, in a mindful way, it's always good to just say, Let's just not have that conversation right now. Oh, why did I offend you or did I? no? I just think it's probably not the best time for us to have that conversation. You know, I've heard from uh, more than one friend who has said that they're actually kind of happy that this year, with social distancing, oh, Thanksgiving no. is a small group and not a big group. So. No, that's not good. We shouldn't look forward to that. We should look forward to the the like gathering of families and even <laughs> the differences that we all have. We shouldn't say uh, like social distancing is good. So I don't have to see that <laughs> uncle <laughs> at the table this week. And I get that. I know how that feels because trust me, there's times where I want to tell my wife, I'm glad your sister, I hope she doesn't ever watch this video. But <laughs> I'm like, I want to tell her, I hope your sister doesn't show up for, for Thanksgiving so that we don't have to <laughs> like dodge these things. But, but it's family. And and it is important that she is there. Um, but I it, like always make sure that if it starts to lean in that direction, I say, hey, whoa, 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 it's the holidays. <laughs> Let's not talk politics. And, very, and I all should be able to do that. Well, that's that's very wise. So you and your wife have five children, is that right? Including yes. two young twins. Two two-year-old twins that came during this pandemic. They were born on February 2nd uh, of... I don't even remember which year, but there'll be three next year. And I can tell you, this was the hardest year of my life <laughs> in dealing with, I'm sure you're aware of the terrible twos. So multiply that by two kids during a pandemic. I like the gray hairs that you see in my, in my beard right now, that <laughs> like it came all this year. <laughs> so it's been rough. Wow. So, you know, that leads me to wonder, uh, you have spoken probably not during the last six months, but you've spoken at a lot of schools. Yes. Um, in your time. And that's a whole lot different than standing. Here's one example. Uh, that's a whole lot different than standing between police and protesters. But uh, and I was thinking about the comparison. When you're on the front lines, you've said that part of your message is to be the better person and use a soft answer to turn away wrath, Absolutely. which is awesome. Is that the same message for school kids? And the reason I ask is, as someone, you're, you yourself were bullied when you were a kid. Yep. And you know that's a hard message to hear yeah. uh, when you're a kid, to, to be the better person. Is that what you tell them? 
Absolutely. Um, I, I have that same conversation with them because it, it was very real for me. And I, and I know that um, trying to match a bully's intensity can only get a kid hurt. And in, instead, it, taking the more um, mindful approach of recognizing that hurting people hurt people. So a bully is usually hurting because someone is treating them wrong at home, or maybe there's an older sibling or an abusive parent. Someone is hurting that person oftentimes. And so when they come to school and they're lashing out in, in a way that th that's the way they know how to respond or react because that's what they receive day in and day out. So they treat people that way. So I often have to remind young children about that, especially high school and middle school aged kids, that what you don't want to do is try and match your bully's intensity, that you you want to try and have a conversation with that person. You want to bring it up to um, faculty and staff or your teachers or counselors to let them know what's actually happening. Because it's really unfortunate, the, the suicide rates, even amongst young people right now today, uh, the statistics are alarming. And, and I not only like do I study the statistics, but I have to meet these kids regularly. And although I, I haven't been visiting schools as much during the pandemic, I've been doing a lot more virtual talks. But even still, during these virtual talks, during Q&A, now a lot of the kids are sharing with me just about how lonely and depressed they feel just being trapped in, in their houses and not being able to interact with their friends. And, and so it's really tough for them. So I know that young people, they, they experience things in a very magnified way than, than how we deal with it. Sure, as adults, we still deal with loneliness and anxiety and mental health issues, but think about young people who, when they're getting pushed around by a bully, they feel like that's the end of the world for them, you know, that it's never going to get better. And, and I just recently, uh, one school that I was able to speak at here in San Diego, I live in San Diego, California, and there was a, a middle school that I recently spoke at. And there was a young man after my lecture who came and shared with me that right before the pandemic, um, he was sent off to, um, to a hospital because he had mentioned that he wanted to take his own life. And so he said his stay in that hospital was, was very brief because it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. So they just had him in and had him out. And then he went home for a few months and then dropped back into school just recently at the time of my lecture. And he was trying to get tips from me as a 15 year old kid. He was trying to decide in that moment, should he take his own life before this year is over or should he carry on? And, and it just broke my heart because he's 15 and he feels like whatever he's enduring right now, that that's, that's it, that it doesn't get better. And he let me know how he has no friends there to stick up for him. Uh, when he goes home, his parents focus mainly on his younger sibling and he feels invisible. He's got this bully that pushes him around. And all I can think of like really pressing to this kid is this is just a flash moment in your life. It gets better. And so I had to start asking him things like, what do you plan on being in the future? And he told me he wanted to be an air traffic controller. And I made him promise to me. I said, look, I fly around a lot and I'm sure I'm still going to be flying around when you get older. I hope that we can stay connected via social media so that at some point, I'll know that you're the air traffic controller that's making sure that I get safely to my destination. And I want us to be able to communicate enough on Twitter or Facebook for me to know that one day that you got there. And, and that was like the first time that I saw him crack a smile during our entire conversation. And, and so I think that we have to remind people that trying to confront your, your bully or your attacker or in, in like the sense for a, a lot of us, um, people that are rubbing us the wrong way in the workplace or political uh, issues that, that come up, we have to remember you can't fight fire with fire. Sometimes like approaching that situation with love can throw that person off guard and you can turn an enemy into a friend. 
and I've turned a lot of enemies into friends. And for that young person, I don't know exactly what he's going through, but I brought it up to his counselor there at the school to keep an eye on him because I don't think he's in the clear after his brief visit in the hospital. Um, but we do follow each other on social media now. And um, through my network, I'm hoping to find someone that maybe works here in the San Diego airport where I can get him to do a tour of like some behind the scenes things there to give him hope to like live on right? Like you're 15 years old, you're going to throw your life away because someone keeps pushing you around in school. You got to do like focus on bigger things than that. And so um, that's what I, I try to work on. But I know that it's all compassion. It really is. It's it's how when we, when we take those moments to really just think about and care for the people that are, are around us, that compassion starts to come out, that love, that, that positive human interaction and connections that we get to have with people um, help us to all move forward. Yeah. Ken, you mentioned uh, before um, Martin Luther King Jr. as a role model, and you certainly channel him in your work. Um, uh, I was thinking, I, I love this image here um, Thank you. at an event. Uh, do you have other role models you'd mention or advise uh, other people to follow? Yeah, so I, I always tell people some of my favorites that, that I love to study their work. It's Dr. Martin Luther King, um, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, and Jesus Christ, right? Because all of them led like this, this life of peace and love and trying to unify people. And I think that it's important that we all take pages from from their life and and try to mimic that or replicate that in in ourselves um i i think so many of us especially um in in recent times are so quick to anger and it's shocking to me actually when you see even a lot of these viral videos how quick people go from zero to 100 on like their level of anger and and frustration and I, I just wish that we could all, as a nation, as a world, take a step back and just start to look at each other as human beings and, and really work towards some of the messages and the legacies that those role models left behind for us, you know? And there were such powerful role models, like even like with Jesus, right? Whether, regardless of a person's religious background or beliefs, like the historical figure of Jesus, like, it led a life of love and and peace and turn the other cheek and it's like why do we struggle so much to replicate that right like this is someone whose legacy has lived on for thousands of years in in history and like it's such a great example for us to live by and and i think that for some people it's easier than others and and it's important that we all try to channel that can you speak movingly about the need uh, to foster an inclusive society? Yes. What's next for you and the project to advance that goal? Oh, great question. So uh, the pandemic, I always tell people that um, for myself with, with my work, uh, I feel like COVID-19 is my version of Superman's kryptonite. Like it has literally derailed me from a lot of the things that I wanted to do and like the goals that I had. And, and so right now I'm kind of in a transitional period where simply just to get by when the pandemic first started, um, I shifted a lot of my work towards just trying to get medical professionals, the PPE that they needed. So I was flying in masks and gloves and sanitizer and distributing those to nurses, doctors, dentists, just so that they can get back to work. And then that became like, a full-blown business that I didn't really like try to sign up for, but it just got uh, handed to me because I knew where to get shipments from at a time where it seemed like the world was just at a standstill. Um, so for the past few months, that has been my focus. Uh, but I think now more than going into these areas of conflict, uh, which I will still do, but I'm a little bit more cautious of my surroundings now being a father of five. And especially with having like my youngest being two year old babies in the house. You can imagine my wife when, when I'm like, I'm heading out to Minneapolis for the George Floyd protest. She's like, no, you're not. And I'm like, well, I have to. She's like, we've got a pandemic going on. I'm like they're shooting people out there. 
I don't think this is a good idea. And I was like, I will wear a bulletproof vest. I have a gas mask that is stronger than a three ply mask <laughs> that I'll wear out there and we'll make it work. And so I was still effective in, in being out there, but I actually didn't show up on the front lines on the night of the violence. I led a large group of people to meet me at the main um, intersection where they burned down the police station, the Target, AutoZone, Wendy's. And I put out a post on my Facebook page on the Free Hugs Project. And I said, anyone that wants to join us in efforts to restore and rebuild this community after nights of violence, meet me there. And surprisingly, hundreds of people showed up and we we cleaned up that entire um, few blocks that were in the area. And it was just an amazing sight. So, so I'm finding that there's a lot of impact that comes from uh, the, the next step, like not always being there just uh, during the point of conflict, but also really trying to um, create healing after the fact. Well, you know, uh, Ken, um, <clears throat> you are a kind and generous change maker. I, I mean, I have to thank you for this this conversation. I yeah. promised you it would be pretty brief, and then I find myself fascinated by what you do. <laughs> so I kept you here far you. longer. In fact, I'm now plunged into. You can see uh, the Arizona twilight has taken over me. I'm facing a window <laughs> in Arizona, and it's, I'm still in the darkness. But it doesn't matter. You've led us to the light, so I appreciate everything oh, you do. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was really great. And, and I hope that um, people can really benefit from, from this interaction. And, and just a reminder right now that as we're all kind of like wondering what next after this pandemic, that hopefully we all come out of this as better versions of ourselves, that we really recognize that we're all going through it. We're all struggling. And so let's just try to be a little bit more kind in the interactions that we have with other people. Absolutely. Perfect closing. Thank you so much, Ken. And thank you to all of our attendees who came to our first ever virtual conversation uh, convention. Yep. Uh, we appreciate you being here. Be well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.